and we usually just I record them and we just jump in and we see where it goes and um, sure. I'm, I'm really thankful that you I should give a little introduction um, this is this is Reverend John Sook and John is a um, John, I, I want John to tell his story John is a minister in the United Church of Canada and he was a very prominent um, minister in the Christian Reformed Church before this, and he's an author, wrote really quite a compelling book on, on his journey. And so I wanted to do a video conversation with John about his journey and just with what John is thinking. So John, thank you so much for being willing to do this. Uh-oh. Sure, looks like it should be fun. Well, why so, don't, go ahead. Oh, the internet. No, no, I wondered if there were, had been a glitch there for a sec. Yeah, Did there was. Say, oh, oh. oh, I see. <laughs> there was, and and yeah, internet, internet's been a little wobbly and Zoom's been a little wobbly. So with uh, everybody trying to do this online, um, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see what we can get done. So John, why don't, why don't, um, why don't we begin now, most of my channel will never have heard anything about you. Um, there are some people from the CRC that watch my channel, but mostly just a few pastors, and they'll, of course, know a little bit more about you. So but most of my channel has focused on, uh, I just do a lot of conversations with people and their journey of faith. I find there's a lot of interest in um, calling and um, you know why on earth people would be ministers today. I don't know if you've seen Andrew Root's latest couple of books on pastoring and postmodernity, but um, uh, his, his last one is quite compelling. But why don't, why don't we begin with uh, you growing up and where you grew up and what growing up was like and what faith was like in the household that you grew up in? Yeah, sure. I grew up in St. Catharines, Ontario, near Niagara Falls, across the lake from Toronto. My parents were both immigrants from uh, the Netherlands, engaged in the Netherlands, and my mother moved here following my dad by about a year. So I was born in uh, the mid 50s. We were all Christian Reformed. So my whole dad's family came and um, we went to Christian Reformed Church in St. Catharines. Early it was Maranatha, which I believe no longer exists, and that mother the church and then uh, Trinity which later left the denomination to become so I, I grew up in the Christian Reformed Church it was great uh, I was uh, a Calvinist cadet and um, I was the youngest kid and later on we moved to Brampton and I was the youngest kid I think who ever did a profession of faith in the church um, and I remember going to my first congregational meeting when I was about 13 years old and everybody looking at me like, what in the world is he doing here? A good memory because people were nice. Uh, my family was, you know, as a minister, you see all kinds of people and some are really put together very well and others are not. Some people overcome great tragedies and nevertheless shine for their whole lives. And other people have everything handed to them on a platter, but they can't make anything of it. I, I was really fortunate to have a family where the love was real, where there were no, no secrets, where, you know, my dad was a little bit, you know, distant, I would say, but, you know, no one ever doubted his love. You could talk to him when you wanted to. Uh, very, very little to no corporal punishment. Um, five kids, we got along for the most part, spaced every two years apart like a good Dutch CRC family should, I suppose. Um, my mom, who, uh, my dad died at a very young age. He was about 54, heart attack, stroke. Um, so that's some 30 some years ago already. But my mom still is alive. She lives in Holland Christian Homes. I'm really close to her. Um, really concerned during this COVID-19 thing for her living in an independent living situation. She has her own apartment. But uh, So, you know, a really happy family. My dad was uh, a life insurance agent for most of the time I was growing up. 
But there came a point in 1969 when the entire staff of the Toronto District Christian High School was fired. Um, or if not fired, they quit in protest um, because some novel um, was not allowed to be taught. I think it was Catch-22 or something like that. So when the whole faculty left, they had to hire a new faculty real quick. And my dad had a preaching license, even though he was a life insurance salesperson. And so they hired him to teach business and um, what we called in those days, man in society, which was kind of a, a world perspective, nine and 10. And uh, so he, he was well known as a good preacher long before he became a minister. And um, teaching at a Christian high school just brought him closer to that. He, um, he was uh, pretty easygoing, an early advocate of uh, women office bearers. Um, so, you know, it was a, a very non-threatening kind of relationship on that side. And my mom was just nurture all the way. Um, uh, smart, very smart. She, you could talk with her about big issues, but, you know, she was about nurture. That was job number one. So uh, that was my family. Uh, since those early days, my next, uh, my brother, who was a year and a half actually younger than I, died of ALS. It was about uh, eight years ago or so, 10 years ago now. And um, so I spent uh, a good six months full time and six months part time looking after him. That was a very transformative kind of um, situation. I was between jobs. He lived out in Kelowna, so I'd fly out for three weeks and then fly home to Toronto. Kelowna's in British Columbia. One of my sisters would take over for a week, and then for the last six months, we just shared it out. That was a, a powerful influence. He was a, a really conservative, evangelical type. Uh, not culturally conservative, but conservative biblically and stuff, especially as he approached death. Um, I have three sisters who are still living. Um, one's a lawyer, one's a hospital administrator, and one is, um, well, what do you call it? human resources administrator. So that's, that's my family. I am the only one of my siblings who still goes to church. Oh, I would say that my three sisters have Christian convictions, but church has been irrelevant to the experiences they were having in life, not helpful. And so they weren't going to invest in it at a certain point, even though they had been elders and deacons and, and Christian school board members and all that, they've all drifted away. And that's maybe where I would have gone to if I had not been a minister. <laughs> So that's a little bit about my background. I have good memories. I have good memories of growing up in my family, and I'm still close to my family of origin. Well, you know, I've I've continued to follow your blog. I don't know if you know this, but I, I actually, I believe you owned a house on Prince Street in Grand Rapids, and myself and a couple of friends rented the apartment downstairs from you for a few years back when I was... Um, I would have been starting seminary in those days, I suspect. But yeah, actually, I had sold the house by that time to Phil Weaver. Okay. I think. Okay. And yeah, that, uh, that, that rings a bell. We lived in it. Yeah. That rings a bell. But it was my house, yeah. Well, and I've, I've been following, um, especially after you wrote your book, because, you know, I knew you were editor of the banner and had done a missionary stint. But, um, and then, you know, I, I really got interested after you wrote your book and I've been following your blog. And one of the things that I, I really respect about you is that, you know, as you, as you talk about your sisters, I mean, that story is not an unusual story by any means. And that's been, uh, that's been an area of interest of mine. And one of the things that I really respect about you and, and the decisions that you've made is that when, so after, so my father was a Christian reform minister his whole life, um, 36 years in Patterson, New Jersey. 
um, retired in, in Whitensville, Massachusetts. And I remember, and then just, just kept doing ministry the way he always had, except there were a few things he didn't have to do anymore and did interim pastoring. And so, you know, well up into his, his seventies. And I asked him once, I said, dad, you know, are, do you ever get tired of it? And he said, you know, our, our connection is going to go in and off. Don't worry about it. We'll, we'll see what the recording um, ends up like. He said, you know, I, I love it more than ever. And that was in contrast to a coffee, and I'm going to be careful about names here, of when I first left the DR and came to California and started as a local, you know, a pastor here, as opposed to the foreign missionary where I got started, and listening to one particular pastor talk and thinking, when I get to be his age, I don't want to be anything like him. Because I had the sense that he still believed, he still was going through the motions, but inside something had died, and he was hanging on for the pension. And I thought, if this is how you're going to live your life, I don't want to have any part of that. I'd rather have my father's story than his story. And what you did, John, and... I think a lot of people won't recognize this. In our Christian Reformed culture, what you did took a tremendous amount of courage because you were honest about your convictions, and although obviously received criticism for them, you were honest about your convictions and you acted upon them. And, you know, I don't know if you look at what you did in this light, but I, I saw it as courageous and honorable and i've really appreciated you for that even though you know i continue to be a minister in the christian reformed church and don't have a problem with it but i you know i've always respected how you managed yourself through this thing and i i did want to take a minute to just to just say that to you thanks well let's um, go ahead well, let's, so you were, you were, you know, a lot of people listening won't understand what profession of faith means in the Christian Reformed Church. That's sort of like confirmation where you, you're baptized as an infant, but then often as a young adult, usually Christian Reformed youth would have gone through catechism together. And then at the end of that process, there's the expectation that you would make adult profession of faith, which at that point in the Christian Reformed Church meant you were then welcome to partake in communion, something at that time that we didn't do as children in the Christian Reformed Church, and it was a rite of passage. And, and to do so at a young age um, said something about you, that you were precocious and you were interested in the life of the church. And that obviously uh, bore its way out in terms of your vocational path. What what and when prompted you to to pursue ministry as a vocation when you were young? Yeah, I um, I never subscribed, and I have my father, I think, to thank for this. I never subscribed to the theory that a minister has a call that's any different than anyone else's. My dad used to, you know, being a good kite in the Christian Reformed Church for a certain 120 year old leader now. But being a good Kyperian meant that, you know, every person's work was hopefully their calling. And my dad said, look, you can be a teacher, you can be a life insurance salesperson, you can be a minister, or you can be a mother or father at home. It doesn't matter. Whatever, you know, just make sure that to the degree you have to do some chords with your desire do something that's fascinating and interesting that's your calling you know what makes your heart joyful as more than one commentator has said um so for me uh going into the ministry wasn't a voice from heaven it was me saying hey you know i'm a pretty good talker i love studying I have a deep love for the church. I get along with people. I'm 
a low conflict sort of person. I'm not going to cause great waves anywhere I go. I think the ministry is good for me. And it helped that my father, without cracking the whip, nevertheless often nudged me in that direction. So that when I had finally decided that, no, I'm not going to be a minister, and I did a couple of years of high school teaching, I woke up one morning and I said, you know what? I think I'd rather be a minister and go back to school. <laughs> Going back to school actually um, was one of the attractions of being a minister. I, I just love reading, studying. And so seminary was uh, other graduate studies for my PhD. It's, it's the studying too, but the study was top of the top of the list. Okay. So um, my call to ministry, there was nothing mystical about it. It was uh, the right match between my gifts, my avocations, and that's um, what I believed at that time God was calling me to. Well, to find that match, that is. So you did. So you did your undergraduate work, and you 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 first became a a teacher. Yeah, I did two years of high school English teaching. Okay. It was more um, because I graduated from Calvin and English major. What do you do? <laughs> you know. So I just wrote a bunch of schools and said, "Hey, you know, I'm an English major. Do you have an English teaching job?" I didn't have a teaching certificate or anything. Found a school that was willing to have me and uh, worked out great. I, I enjoyed teaching a great deal, I still do. And perhaps one of my biggest regrets about my career is that, uh, I mean, it's complicated, but that I didn't settle on a, a teaching career at a point when I could have. Okay, okay. So you went to Calvin Seminary? Yeah. And how were those years, years for you? It was great. Um, I. I wasn't racked by doubt, and I had a lot of fun being on the left side of things. Now, let's be honest, we, we all, um, you know, if we've thought about it, we take some pleasure in being the person who we are, and I was always a little bit out of the box. And uh, the seminary gave me room for that, for the most part. I, I, uh, I had a hard time with the languages I did in um, university already, but um, got by okay, and I really enjoyed systematic theology with, you know, some of the professors that you will remember too. Um, <laughs> Fred Kloster was uh, a professor of mine, uh, pipe-smoking, old curmudgeon, calm, conservative, uh, but, you know, he had the time to humor me, take me into his office and poke at me for my um, leftward thinking and, and uh, taught me not to take any position too seriously and to enjoy the ride. And yeah, I, I had a good time at seminary. Um, I, I also remember seminary as the time that my wife and I had our two kids. And let's be honest you seminary classes two a day maybe and the rest of the time you're home doing your homework or you're socializing with your seminary friends uh what a great way to start a family so flexible so much um studying you can do at night when everybody's in bed but be available during the day when you know kids are awake and interested in what's going on i love the seminary the last year of seminary, I was on the Calvin Center for Christian Scholarship as a student fellow, and we studied creation and cosmogony with Howard Ventil and um, uh, Clarence Meninga uh, and John Steck. It was fantastic to be um, so closely supervised and to participate in the actual ongoing discussion about what was then a really important issue. I loved it. Um, no classes to speak up, just, just you know, a never ending coffee clutch over, over these big issues for a whole year. It was great. Wow. Yeah. yeah. That, sounds, that sounds terrific. 
so so you got out of seminary um how did the calling process go where did you go what was it like starting out then now in a church or did you go to a church your first call out yeah i went to redeemer christian reform church in sarnia i'll never forget that because the uh i went there to preach on call and the guy who had me over for the evening uh, i slept overnight was the chair of the calling committee and the first thing he said to me when i sat down in his living room was well, I know you're preaching on call, but as the chair of the calling committee, I have decided you're too young. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how it turned out. And uh, I left and I thought, okay, um, where am I going to preach next? What's the next opportunity? And someone else called me back and said that... Um, you know, job so that was great um that the first day i was on the job came to me and he went on to say listen um we are going to do everything we have to do over these next four years as a congregation we're going to do whatever it takes to give you a wonderful experience and they did that wow um that's not so common <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it isn't common, but this was this was a this was a great. It still is a great congregation, Redeemer Christian Reformed Church, Sarnia. So I had a blast there for four years. Um, they they were honest, straight. You know, I I my path through the church has been uh, really blessed to use a certain kind of language by people and institutions that cared a lot for me, and that. Uh, so I got off to a great start in Sarnia. Um, what after, was it? Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, after Sarnia, I went to Ann Arbor, another uh, college town, University of Michigan town. We were on the edge of the University of Michigan campus. Another great experience. I split my time there between youth ministry and half the preaching. And uh, yeah, good people. I, I had eight great years of ministry to start things off. And I was gung-ho the whole time, the whole way gung-ho in what sense i was having fun mm -hmm. I, I i loved preaching and i think part of my ability to do well in churches had to do with the fact that when i had most people together sunday mornings and then those early in sarnia and ann arbor sunday afternoons um i you know i was i was a pretty good preacher and people were um, interested in what I had to say, and I got kudos for it. And that was a, I'm, I'm not saying it's the only way for a minister to make it in a church, but it was a good enough platform for me to do my pastoral work from, as long, even though it was, you know, wasn't the thing I spent most time on. Um, people were um, happy to see me, and that made pastoral work easier. Now, probably most list people listening to us won't have any idea what it means to be on the CRC left. And that's something that, you know, you and I sort of share. I grew up, my father was a um, ardent reader of the Reform Journal, couldn't wait until, you know, every time it would come. Uh, women in office was the, um, was the issue of great concern through many of those years in the um in the in the latter part of the 20th century um what what were your if you have to think about think back over those those first two pastorates of yours what was your great concern for the people that you were ministering to uh i think one concern i had in both churches was that the smart people in the church laughed at all efforts by the denomination to keep a lid on issues like uh, women in office and um, creationism, you know, was there a real flood, Adam and Eve, original sin, that sort of stuff. I mean, people who were well educated, and there were a lot of them in my first two churches, uh, they they loved the Christian Reformed Church and were in the habit of 
mocking some of the um, uh, issues that people um, were seriously discussing at synods and at classes meetings. I remember that in the, my first congregation, for example, I had been invited to give um, a talk to the, a neighboring Christian Reformed Church in Wyoming, Ontario, uh, to their women's group about what I really thought about Genesis. And in this talk, I told them that we were stuck in a terrible place talking about historicity and we had to accept this as mythological, but true, right? Which is an old saw on the left. And um, getting a letter from the, at, signed by every woman in this group saying, I had better change my mind or, or I was going to hell. And then <laughs> sharing that letter with my counsel at Redeemer, and having to a man in those days, everyone shaking their heads and saying, we can't, that is so sad. What, you know, are you doing all right? You know, and, and kind of the dawning recognition on, on my part that there, were, there was a significant undercurrent within the Christian Reformed Church of people who just did not buy it, but were family members tribe members. Uh, that was a concern. I was also concerned about other things that, you know, um, drinking among teens, you know, the regular kinds of things, drinking among teens. Uh, I was concerned about um, the when faster by how little my teenagers knew about the um, teachings of the church, how biblically illiterate they were, even though, the, but you know, Ann Arbor was a place where there were no Christian schools to speak of. And so that was quite different compared to my first church. Um, so those were some of my concerns, but I was mostly not concerned. I was having fun. That, that dynamic, that's that fascinated me. The smart people of the church laughed, yet these were people who maintained the institution. Mm -hmm. They, you know, they tied, they supported the church with their finances. They gave the church their Sunday mornings and and midweek evening meetings. Um, what was the church for for them? Do you think? Well, they, you could start with what the church was not for. The church was not for telling them what to believe about Genesis. And the church was not for rulemaking and for uh, making sure people did all the right things all the time. For it, but the reasons people belonged to the church were different in my first two congregations. The first one was very tribal. Um, there had been two churches in Sarnia. There was a feeling that there needed to be a third church. This is 20 years before I came. Um, so all the Institute for Christian Studies supporters got together. They're the liberal ones and said, let's start a third church. There's a lot of these third churches in Toronto cities. And so they started a third church. These were all the most progressive people. They stuck to the Christian Reformed Church because of a mix of being um, committed to Kuiper's idea that wherever they were, whatever they did, they could make an impact that was um, socially just and good for um, the world and biblical. They, they belonged to the Christian Reformed Church because everyone in their families belonged to the Christian Reformed Church. And they belonged to the Christian Reformed Church in Sarnia, at least, because there were a lot of people just like them. That is not merely Dutch tribal, but people who were on the left and, and who understood the language and who they raised their kids, who went to the same Christian schools with. Um, so, so it was more tribal there with this kind of ICS left wing mixed in. Whereas uh, the church in Ann Arbor, except on science issues maybe, but the church in Ann Arbor was more evangelical, um, maybe only a third to a half Dutch Christian reform background. Uh, lots of people who had connections to the University of Michigan. And for them, I think uh, they belonged to the church because they grew, had grown up Christian. And Ann Arbor Christian Reformed Church was 
a modern church that had good choir, good preaching, good worship, good location, and really nice people. Like one of the biggest differences between my Canadian and American experiences was the experiencing firsthand, not the closed kind of Dutch um, straight talk and in your face, this is how it is, take it or leave it, but this kind of hyper politeness and kindness and embracing of others. And I loved it, you know, quite frankly. Um, so the, the, those were, they were different churches in that way. But again, both churches were remarkable for uh, embracing and being kind to their pastors. And it helped me get a really good start in the ministry. Why did you leave Ann Arbor? Because I, became, <laughs> I, had, I was hired as the next editor for the Banner, which is a magazine of the denomination I was part of. In those days, it had maybe 30,000 weekly subscribers who paid. By the time I left, it was closer to 100,000 monthly subscribers who received the magazine as a service from the denomination. Yeah. Uh, so they called me up one day, um, out of the blue, I couldn't believe it. They said, well, you've written some interesting articles, you've published some sermons, you won an award for Harper and Rose Best Sermon. Would you like to be the banner editor? I was up against someone who was well known in the denomination, who was um, a highly esteemed minister. His name was Carl Zalstra who would have done a great job at the magazine. I don't know if he was the president of Dort College at that time or not, or if that came later, but I, you know, he was an all round great solid kind of guy who had his PhD, he was uh, in uh, homiletics, I believe. And so I went into the interview kind of with my hands in my pocket and I shrugged my shoulders and said, this will be fun without any expectation of getting the job. So they said, well, what would you do if you became banner editor? How would you change the magazine? And I said, oh, I don't think I'd change it much. You know, look at all these people are paying for it. It, it must be great. And, you know, Kyvan Hoven was a great editor. Uh, he had been before the previous one to me and, and he liked to rile things up a little bit. I think I would too, you know, but pastorally sensitive as I do so. And uh, so I, yeah, I just went in there without any expectations or even without a plan to get the job. And so I was blown away by getting it. A, a lot of people who do not have a history in the Christian Reformed Church will, it'll be difficult for them to appreciate the significance of this position in the denomination historically. And it's very interesting, the story that you just told me, because again, Carl Zylstra was someone who was well known in the denomination, and you're exactly right in how you frame this in terms of he would have been for a certain segment of the denomination, he, he is someone who, for his generation, in a, to a certain degree, lived the trajectory of that, of, of what an ideal Christian Reformed minister's career should be. Oh, totally. And he and, still did it anyway. Yeah. And <laughs> in a sense, your I mean, and this is part of the reason I wanted to talk to you, because I also have a sense that your story is similar in that sense, but for a whole group of people who no longer go to Christian Reformed churches or any churches. And so it's interesting, the choice, just as you know, just as a lot of people make a lot of the choice between Tony Dikema and Nick Waltersdorf in terms of Calvin College's trajectory, the choice of the of you instead of Carl Zylstra for banner editor at that point, that's a very interesting, now looking back at it in retrospect, that's a very interesting choice. Well, sure it was. It was definitely um, I, a sense on the Board of Publications, which ran the magazine, that more of the same was not gonna work. Mm -hmm. and, but they thought of the same in terms of a middle-aged minister type. And they wanted something different, 
which was a young person who has the right bona fides, but who nevertheless is going to be somewhat out of the box compared to what everybody would have expected. I think that's what they went for. Yeah. Um, but, you know, who knows? Who knows? It was, uh, as they say, providential. <laughs> and uh, I landed at the banner. Uh, what did you learn being banner, banner editor? I learned a lot of things. Uh, I, I learned uh, how diverse the Christian Reformed Church is. People have no idea. I already had a bit of an idea being in Ann Arbor and Sarnia. Uh, but the first time I left the banner office, I went to California for one of, um, in those days, Peter Borgdorf's exercises where you got to look at a statue from different sides and you were supposed to describe it. And so in that way, we were supposed to see that perspective really mattered and that people could have different perspectives, but look at the same matter. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't say anything, but um, some guy pulled me aside afterwards and he said, what did you think of that? And I said, oh, it was great. And he actually pulled me up by my shirt and pushed me against the wall and started yelling at me about how this was a total disaster for the CRC, so much so that someone had to walk by and get me released. This was all before I got 10 words in edgewise with a smile. Wow. <laughs> now that's an extreme sort of example, right? But, um, you know, from the Midwest farmers to the German reformed, to the Canadian Kuyperians, to the Canadians who got dragged into the CRC because it was a tribe and didn't know anything about the Bible. We had a bunch of those in, in Sarnia. Um, people who ended up in the CRC because landmen grabbed them off the trains when they immigrated from Holland and put them in a housing place where they were all Christian reformed people. Um, to, uh, you know, the academic elite in Grand Rapids, the denominational elite that is, or um, the urban outlier CRCs in places like Kansas City or <clears throat> Ann Arbor or New York or who are still in the CRC somehow, but have followed their own path in terms of their personal spirituality. Well to do and not well to do. Um, uh, <laughs> all of us wishing we had more um, African Americans or Navajos in the church and making excuses for why we didn't, but actually they really wanted it. They just couldn't do what was asked of them. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's such like, how is this a denomination? Theologically, not really. Um, theologically, in the sense that we have ancient placeholders that we all nod at and smile about, and some of us actually even take seriously um, the confessions or the traditions. But mostly um, habit, superstition, family, and those are not all bad reasons. When you say, uh, go ahead. Yeah, I learned a lot more at the banner. Um, I, I mean, it was during the banner that I got my PhD in communication theory. And so I decided to do a secular degree in communications because I wanted to teach homiletics at some point. But I didn't want to take uh, a whole bunch of courses in how to properly um, do hermeneutics. I wanted courses in how to preach effectively. And I thought, okay, I'll get out of the hermeneutics part of it by going to a secular school. Mm -hmm. Well, I got five, six years of secular hermeneutics there. And it changed me. It, um, I learned things that um, contributed to the eventual decision to leave the CRC during my PhD studies. Um, that, for me at that time, it was really exciting and positive. And, I, and when friends ask me what was your saddest day in the ministry, I'll often say the day I had my last PhD seminar class. 
I have always been one for um, going to class. I loved it, and I missed it a lot afterwards. I also learned that uh, Grand Rapids is not the Christian Reformed Church. Um, people think that uh, that's in part because, uh, you know, it's a city and they're all into themselves and they're into 2850. But, you know, it, it's the rest of the Christian Reformed Church is in Grand Rapids, you know, Clar Grand, the, the northern part of the city, Holland, Mich you know, but the denominational building, um, that's, the, that's not the same as the rest of the CRC in terms of the convictions and history and stories of the people who work there. Um, and they affect each other and they change each other in ways that you, you don't get changed if you're living in Holland or if you're living in Muskegon or someplace, um, or in Sarnia for that matter. Uh, I, I think things came to a head for me at the banner near the end of my tenure there when First Toronto Christian Reformed Church was trying to come out of the closet about the gay issue. And the minister there was my best friend, Nick Overdoom. And uh, so we had talked about this off and on for years. I knew he was under incredibly difficult personal pressure, both in the sense that, you know, this was a hard thing for him pastorally to lead his church through, but also in the sense of, say, a Howard Vandertil, Vandertil who, who was chased out of the church just by meanness and anger at the fact that he had a different view. And uh, so then it became clear to me that an editorial needed to be written about that situation, but I knew I couldn't do it. And it was one of the hardest things I did in my career to go to Nick and say, look, nobody hired me at the banner to be a loose cannon. And I can't go there and say, we need to make room for you. I need to ask someone else to write an editorial about your situation. So I think that was John Veenster, who was the head of the Canadian CRC at the time. And he wrote a very pacific, very beautiful, for his convictions, um, editorial. But, you know, I just came home and I said, I can't do this much longer. Like, I can't pretend, you know. It really became clear to me that there was a part of my job where I was pretending. Mm. And um, so I had to stop. Well, that, you know, that when I talk about, when I tell the story of, of that, of sitting down and listening to that CRC pastor, it was exactly that duplicity that I, I heard in this individual. And I thought, I never want to be that person. And so you left the banner and where did you go and why? So I, um, I actually didn't have that many job opportunities after the banner. Um, I had finished my PhD about three or four years earlier and, and had at that time explored leaving the banner. Um, I had some really good opportunities to become uh, a professor in secular schools teaching communication theory. <laughs> One was Louisiana State, I remember. There were a couple schools out in the Midwest, but I felt as if I had made an obligation, uh, that I had an obligation with the banner, especially since they had so generously supported my PhD studies to stay for the 10 years that I had promised. So when that was up, um, my secular teaching opportunities, because I hadn't been publishing and I'd been out of, you know, they had also dried up. So I, I took a teaching position at Asian Theological Seminary in homiletics. Uh, it was an adventure. It was an opportunity to be out of the limelight and to do a rather simple but interesting job, you know, just to teach the mechanics of preaching, which is what I had really wanted to do. Uh, I, I didn't fit in in the Philippines at all because the evangelicalism that the CRC had connected to there was, you know, just a whole different world than I was used to. Fortunately, the faculty at the seminary I taught at, which was a mix of Asian and, and Western professors, was way more open-minded than the 
churches that they were serving. So there was a refuge there among some friends uh, where I could, you know, talk, have ongoing discussions. Uh, after I had been there for just two or three years, I also found that uh, I wasn't dealing very well with the anxiety of just living in Manila. It's, it's, it's a chaotic and difficult place between the pollution and the driving and the, you know, getting your groceries and going to church and, and getting to work in the mornings and oh man, oh man. Um, uh, yeah, that was, it was, it was a, a chaotic place. I still have contact with a number of students from that era, which I really treasure. It was, the teaching was a blast. Mm. But then even the teaching was kind of silly because I kept pointing my students to um, Filipino ways of telling the story as a means of breaking them away from the three-point style of Western preaching that they had been taught before. But I couldn't demonstrate it for them because I'm not Filipino. It, it's one of those areas where uh, you need a professor who's a Filipino who isn't beholden to Western traditions of learning. And I think they have that now. So um, that, that would have been a better thing for, for them too. Uh, and I, after I'd been there two years, I got a call from the Institute for Christian Studies Christian Graduate School at the University of Toronto that is affiliated with the Toronto School of Theology. Um, it does PhDs in philosophy and MAs in philosophy. It has a long history of being connected to the Christian Reformed Church. And it has a long history of being way, way out on the left, way too far out on the left of the Christian Reformed Church. Um, so those supporters, those people who support the Institute for Christian Studies now tend to be not all CRC anymore and more united, Presbyterian, or have left the CRC. Um, although there's still, in Canada at least, a pretty strong support group that takes collections for the ICS, you know, two or three times a year. I, I, um, I left the ICS after three years for a number of reasons, but the main one was that if, as a president of a educational institute, you spend half the year on the road raising money. Yeah. I was good at it. We made our budgets, but it was killing me. So what did you do after, what did you do after that? I, I thought, okay, I'm gonna give one more shot. I, I always enjoy pastoring, I'll try that again. So after after I told the ICS that I was leaving um, churches that were advertising for ministers, and I said, I'd love to uh, talk to you about your position. You just have to know ahead of time that I will um, promote uh, the view that um, gays ought to be included in the full life of the church. I will promote that denominationally and locally. And I will... Um, not uh, get all uptight about creation or evolution because those things just, uh, you know, creation never happened and evolution did. So all the churches got back to me, that got back to me, said, no, we're not, we're not doing that. But one little country church, Coburg, Ontario, said, hey, we're good. And um, so I gave that a shot. It was uh, beautiful people lovely congregation. They'd had a, a beloved child of the congregation die of AIDS, you know, 10 or 15 years earlier. That had led to a lot of people reconsidering, you know, um, the forgive the sinner, but uh, don't uh, forgive, the, uh, you know, what do they say? Something about the sin. Uh, reject the sin and for love the sinner. But anyways, they weren't into that. Um, I, but after three years, every Sunday was just hard. Because mm. I was changing my mind. Um, I couldn't, I, it all came to a head one day when I was teaching catechism to a young woman who wanted to um, join the church. She was marrying a son of the church. She didn't have to join the church. I was good with that. You know, she was Roman Catholic or something. But she wanted to join the church. So, so I said, sure, I, let me 
walk you through the catechism. That's a good summary of what they believe here. And I was on the part of the catechism on the atonement of Jesus, substitutionary atonement, and I was 15 minutes into the lesson. I looked at her and I closed the book and I said, you know what, I can't continue tonight. I, I just can't continue. Um, I didn't explain to her why, but I must have said it in a way that she thought, whoa, okay, I'm going home. <laughs> she went home. <laughs> I can imagine that meeting. It's like, okay, I'm out of here. I don't know what, what you do, but I am not I am not in for the ride. I'm just trying hey, to get married yeah, she's here. Still, she's still a Facebook friend, so what can I say? <laughs> Anyways, um I that I, I immediately talked to my wife, Irene, who's been a partner in my crimes. And uh I called the chair of council that same night and said, I'm resigning. I, I cannot do this anymore. So big shock to them. You know, they were very nice about it. They, I did, it wasn't nice for that congregation to go through what I put them through, but they were very nice about it. And, you know, they gave me, I think four more weeks on the pulpit to wrap it up and say goodbye as long as I was going to be pastorally sensitive to the different places we were at, they were okay with that. And um, I was done. Uh, my doubt, my religious doubt, um, had gotten the better of me and I had changed my mind so considerably that I could no longer be an evangelical Christian. Um, it was a dawning realization that went back to my days in graduate school, but uh, you know, it was it was a battle. And some mornings I'd wake up and think I can do this, and other mornings I'd wake up and say, "No, I don't think I can deal with this. I need to do something else." I tried a few other things, and in the end, I said in order to maintain my own sense of self and of honesty and integrity, I decided to leave the Christian Reformed Church. So I did. <laughs> when did you start writing the book? Oh, I started writing the book when I was banner editor already. There's at least three or four good banner editorials that are incorporated in that book. Like um, the one about having a personal relationship with Jesus was one of my most commented on banner editorials when I said, you can't have one. Um, but I started writing it in earnest after the um, Institute for Christian Studies, I, I had to take care of my brother that year. And that's when I wrote it. So that would have been around uh, 2000 and yeah, around the year 2000, I guess. No, 2003, I finished at the banner. 2000, yeah, 2005, something like that. 2009, it was published anyway. Okay. So 10 years ago. What, what about, can, can you be a little bit more specific about the dissonance you experienced that, that came to a head in, in you know, doing a, you know, a basic catechism class for, uh, for someone who was, I mean, what, what, I mean, a lot of it's in the book and I, yeah. and the book is, I think the book is, I mean, you've always been a good writer and you tell a story well, and you know, a lot of the, you know, a lot, lot of the details are in the book, but, but what, what sort of, what sort of, I mean, what, because a lot, that's exactly where a lot of people are going to be at in terms of the people that listen to my channel, because I've got people in my channel going both ways on this. So. Yeah, sure. So what, what happened to me? It wasn't one thing. I had, it's really important to understand that. It's like a ball of yarn that you, you have to unravel, and there's, it's made up of lots of little different cords, and it's hard to tease each one out separately. But among the issues that became more and more of a concern were uh, well, first, the big political issues in the Christian Reformed Church, and that would have been creation and evolution and homosexuality. And I, I, there's a pastoral part of me that um, just didn't get the whole homosexuality thing. And even when I went back to scripture, I said, what, all that on those two verses or those three verses? Or 
How come it wasn't even a word in the Bible and the King James Bible? How come it's only modern translations? You know, all that stuff. And creation and evolution, that goes all the way back to my year in seminary, you know, working with uh, Van Til and, and Steck, and just realizing that my private concerns that I'd had as uh, um, a young person, uh, that they were widely shared among the intelligentsia of the church. Um, but uh, I, so that opened up the whole ball of wax. Well, what part of Genesis can you take as history? And eventually I kind of decided um, through my own studies that the Hebrew Bible probably wasn't written until the time or it didn't come together um, as a document until the time of King Josiah to begin with. And uh, that, you know, there was no Moses, there was no Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, that these were, you know, legendary mythic figures about whom great stories were written. Uh, then the, the whole question of whether or not you can get into the intentions and mind of a person who wrote a book or wrote a story and determine what their true intentional meaning, meaning was or what they intended by writing. Uh, then uh, just understanding more and more over time of the history of uh, the, uh, uh, perhaps the doctrine of atonement in particular and Anselm's role in it and the whole notion that God has honor, that God's all uptight about people screwing around with his honor. I thought that can't be like, what kind of a God needs us to worship him? You know, what kind of a God would that, that would be a narcissistic God, you know, that, that's crazy. And then beginning on that basis to see more and more of humanity in the Bible and less and less of a divine hand leading us through it. I, uh, I finally came to a position where I do not believe in the Trinity and the divinity of God, uh, of Jesus. And I think Christianity is probably one path among many that people follow in order to find deeper meaning and deeper purpose in their lives, and it's not a bad one. Um, I think Jesus was a man who uh, lived his convictions and left a mark on humanity for all time since, and I think his early um, the storytellers about Jesus made more of it than Jesus would have, and on and on and on. There's many things I'm sure of. I, I saw an essay that you wrote somewhere about how doubt infects everything. And yeah, you know, I'm really convicted about certain things. I'm convicted about evolutionary theory, kind of like I'm convicted about the theory of gravity. You know, it's not something to have doubts about. I'm convicted of human, the, the importance of human rights for people who are on the margins of society, whether they're racialized or whether they're sexualized as gay or trans or whatever. Uh, I'm deeply convicted that such people need to have um, the same opportunities and live the same full life that other people have. And I, I see the, the basis for such convictions in scripture um, as a dawning realization of members of the early church. I'm, I'm deeply convicted about things like democracy, the importance of family, of not hitting your kids. I'm deeply convicted um, by the power of good storytelling. Um, I'm convicted by the fact uh, of the fact that uh, um, some sort of free enterprise is the best way for humans to figure out how to live in such massive numbers here on this planet Earth. I'm convicted about climate change. What I'm not convicted about, what I doubt is the story I was told about the Bible and that I grew up believing. And I've adopted um, a different story and a different convictions now. And uh, so it's not that I'm a deconstructionist, postmodern doubt monger. It's that I've changed my mind, but I still got a mind. I still have convictions. I still see some things as being incredibly true, incredibly important, incredibly worth suffering and dying for. Um, 
It's just not the story I grew up with. So you, what, again, what's fascinated me, in, in many ways, churches are, well, churches are many things, but churches are stewards of a story. And I think you just articulated it very well that um, you doubt the story you were told about the Bible that you grew up believing. And the, um, I, it's, I'm fascinated by what you said about the Christian Reform Church not being a denomination. And um, what, what fascinates me is, a, is, is the question, what in your mind is a denomination or should a denomination be? Um, and, and how, because you, you know, after writing your book, you, you then, you, you, you continue to be a pastor. And so what's fascinated me, because I, I know people who have had similar journeys like yours, and that goes to, well, now they teach in university, or often they become, you know, clinical therapists. That's a very common path. You stayed in the ministry as such in terms of, I mean, you went to the United Church of Canada, and you've continued, you know, I really appreciate the fact that you continue to blog and you continue to write. And I'm, I'm, I'm deeply fascinated by your story and, and by especially, so if, and, and I mean, one of the things that I learned when I was in seminary was I had to sit down and read the church order for the first time. And also being, I don't know if you're familiar with my story, you know, I grew up in this racial reconciliation church in Patterson, New Jersey, and and so very much on the CRC left. And then I'm reading the church order for the first time and thinking, wow, if there ever was a document designed to preserve a certain conservatism, this is it. And even though CRC has continued to play around with its church order, um, it was like, well, this is, this, is, this is fascinating because I think you said it very well. The Christian Reformed Church is far more diverse than people would imagine. And the Christian Reformed Church that I grew up in, Northside Chapel in Patterson, New Jersey, pastored by Stan Vanderclay and Angie Vogel, you know, torturing us with things that are supposed to be the organ and, um, you know, mostly black folks around me. And I mean, just a very different take on this thing, but yet learning the Heidelberg Catechism and all of this stuff. Um, the CRC was in some ways you know, a, a denomination trying very hard at some levels to maintain a certain story, but uh, struggling to do so in, in a rather impossible context, one might say, of the various different layers of immigration and such. And so with your convictions about some things and being convicted that you no longer have convictions about others, you decide to go and continue to pastor a church. Now, you know, I, I am sure that some of that is, you know, well, you've got to do something to put bread on the table to feed your family and so forth. But as I said, many, many folks who come to similar conclusions find other ways of doing it. Why, why stick with preaching and leading, of all things, a church? And, and what is that church for? So, you know, I'm, I'm good at preaching and I'm a good pastor. And I know how to bring people together within a congregational setting. And so for me, it was never about um, losing my ideals for being a minister. It was about changing my mind about how to minister and what to say as a minister. Uh, I, I was, um, Peter Wyatt was my entry into the United Church of Canada. He was the principal of Emmanuel College, which was a sister school of the Institute for Christian Studies. That's a seminary for the United Church. And he was listening to me one day and he said, John, you're just in the wrong denomination. We have room for you. You know, like you can do all that stuff with us, which is eventually what happened. Um, I, I... I'm not crazy about denominations. I have suggested to friends and colleagues in the United Church that we ought to pay more attention to our congregational roots and less attention to the denomination. 
The United Church is known for having a hierarchy that's very rigid and old fashioned and slow, uh, you know, where, where things happen slowly. Um, it's definitely not a case of the grass being greener on the other side of the fence when it comes to the administration of the denomination over here compared to there. But you have to understand that when I said to this calling committee from the congregation where I now serve that I'm not sure of Jesus' divinity and I often struggle to believe in God and I believe that, um, and so on and so forth, they said, you're our guy. <laughs> so I had to ask them, you know, like what convinced you finally? And they said, well, for the last five years, our previous minister, Ken Gallinger, he's been preaching post-theism. You're kind of conservative compared to him. <laughs> <laughs> so, but, you know, I say that with a great deal of appreciation for um, Ken Gallinger. And, um, you know, he led this church through some difficult times and, uh, he left behind him a thinking congregation that was really more into how to be Christian, and especially as well-to-do, upper-crust kind of people for the most part who were getting older and getting on. Uh, they wanted to know how to be Christian in a way that would have made Jesus smile. And um, so that's what we focus on, and we don't worry about doctrine. They, they say, that's your hobby, go do it, you know? We don't worry about doctrine, that is, as the standards of the church. <laughs> we have a creed here in the uh, United Church, whose name I forget because I only use it during the Lord's Supper, but the last line has something about Jesus and judging, and I just drop it from the creed. The rest is really nice, but you know, I don't believe in Jesus judging. That's a nice idea and all that, but for other people, not for me. No one has even you know, noticed, because that, that's not what they're into. They're not into um, splicing the doctrine. They're interested in very practical Christianity for people in their situation. And I, that's, a, that's a challenge I can preach to and pastor to. So, I love being a minister. Um, I guess I'm kind of like your dad that way. Although I'm getting to the end of my career. I'm getting close to retirement. There's other stuff I'd like to do too. Yeah. It's not a rejection of being a minister. It's more like I have only a limited number of years. And so I want to finish those other things on my career bucket list too. So, so practical Christianity for people in their situation um, Again, my, my fascination is what do they mean by practical Christianity? I mean, what is, who is Jesus to them? And I mean, that just, that just fascinates me. And I think, I think part of the reason I wanted to understand, you, I wanted to talk to you is because unlike many of the people that I talk to, you have a pretty good understanding of at least where I come from in some respects, being the context of the Christian Reformed Church. Mm -hmm. So you know how the, the, in the Heidelberg Catechism, the Ten Commandments section is not written as a, merely as a list of thou shalt nots. Right. It's written rather as um, a series of suggestions for how people can live out of gratitude yeah. um, in a way that um, fulfills especially the second of the two great commandments, to love your neighbor. And in a sense, I've always thought that that section of the Heidelberg Catechism is um, an argument for uh, keeping the first commandment in this sense. You keep the first commandment to love God when you love your neighbor. Mm -hmm. That's what, you know, visiting the person in prison is about. That's what giving him or her the coat off your back is about, feeding them, giving them a drink of water. That's loving God, loving Jesus. So what people in my church want to know is how to live like that given all the complexities of their own lives, um, they have had their hands or do have their hands as presidents and vice presidents of Canadian banks, for example, on the levers of power, but they are hiring managers, they are stockbrokers, they are um, captains of industry. And these are people who, for whatever mysterious reason in their own past, they come to church and they're asking this question, 
how can I do this job as a Christian? You know, how do systems impact what I do? Is it just about the stock owners and profit or um, do my hiring decisions or purchasing decisions or investment decisions have a greater impact and more meaning than just um, making profit for stockholders? Uh, they want to know how to live out of gratitude for the opportunity to live, for the opportunity to experience love, for the opportunity to uh, make a difference for someone else. And what Jesus is for them and what he is for me is a person in the ancient past who one of the first people, not the only one, but one of the first people and his followers to get it, that it's about the neighbor and it's about living in gratitude and it's about making um, life good for yourself by being good to everyone else, about that deeper sense of accomplishment and joy that living such a life is. Some people say to me, well, what do you need a church for that? Uh, you could belong to the Rotary Club and get the same thing. And the truth is, they're absolutely right. I belonged to Toronto's biggest Rotary Club for years. And, you know, we opened with a secular prayer, kind of like what I do now. And we had committees for outreach. And we had a sermon, a talk every, and we did it over a meal, communion. And, and sure, what I do looks a lot like the Rotary Club. But so what? They're both great. Plus, at church, you get the added benefit of a group of people who is more focused inwardly on doing it for each other, as well as just generally doing it for the rest of the world. Like a Rotary Club has all these charitable activities that we can, for others. But in a church, you're building a family. You're building a, a relief and love group amongst people you can count on. Uh, and you're doing it uh, still inspired by the great example of Jesus. I want I want to be I want to be really careful here because what I really don't want to do is um, is what I know a lot of people want me to do. <laughs> right. Sure, take off my head. <laughs> <laughs> that, that I will not do. Um, but you know what? Be and. See, I, I, have to, I have to ask this question, but it's, but people are going to hear this question like, oh, conservative churches have a bright and shining future, whereas um, the, the vestiges of the liberal mainline are sinking like a stone. Um, the, the problem with that equation isn't that, the problem with that equation is the struggling of conservative churches too, which is something obviously quite debated but you know one of the things one of the things that i i picked up a while ago was that at least in the united states church church attendance reached its peak during the cold war and in in many ways you know i grew up and you know just outside of new york city and my father loved to go into the city as as my grandmother did when my grandfather was pastoring in west Sable, long island and one of the regular stops we would make would be Riverside Church. And I grew up just, you know, there's this giant, massive church. It wasn't until really just a few years ago that I learned much about Rockefeller and the history of that church. And because growing up in the Christian Reformed Church, you know, even if you're on the left of the Christian Reformed Church, you still are... Um, you still learn about the the dangerous liberals further to the left of you, and and they're a cautionary tale. Um, but the, I mean, surely on one hand, you you deal with because because my church is is probably at least as at least as elderly and at least as dying as yours. So I'm not going to play any any games with you about that. And yours might be yours might be less elderly and less dying than mine, but 
it, it does lead one to ask the question, is there a future for this, for this archetype of, sure. listen, and I know you've written about it. So, I, you know, I wanted to ask the oh, question. Oh, listen, I am not a Jamesian pragmatist. I'm a Christian. And I say, I follow the example of Christ and he died without a church and without followers. Uh, if the measure of a church is going to be how many people are in the pews during this decade or that decade, we are just sadly mistaken about what churches could be and should be. Um, first of all, on the side of bigger is better, let's talk about some bigger and per the Mormons, Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, NRA. Like, give me a break. Islam. Um, Islam. Uh, numbers do not correlate to truth. They do not correlate to um, the, the wisdom of the community that is so numerous. They don't, uh, it doesn't correlate to justice, law, any of those things. And small numbers, on the other hand, are sometimes uh, very impressive. Uh, you know, talk about Martin Luther King, talk about Gandhi, talk about um, uh, other civil rights heroes, um, talk about um, people who first came out as gay or the United Church, which was the first inter uh, national institution in Canada to promote gay rights. Um, numbers do not correlate to the worth wildness or rightness or truth of any organization. And honestly, I think the United Church of Canada um, doesn't have much of a big numbers future from having been the largest non-Catholic church to being one in the pack these days and having an older uh, demographic profile. Yeah, we're not, we're not headed in the right direction. Um, but, you know, I think we will still have an impact until we don't, and then someone else will pick up the uh, hand over the race and, and finish it for us. I don't worry about numbers. What I do worry about is inspiring people of any religious background or none at all to make Toronto a better city and the world a more livable and just place. Better in your sentence is, you know, very Jesus-y because again, I mean, by the definition, the, you know, if we were to look at, look, look at, you know, it was very popular in, it was very popular a couple of decades ago to have the church write a mission statement and so on and so forth. And I think you, you nicely articulated. We just rewrote ours. Oh, okay. It's, what is it? I don't remember. Like, <laughs> like basically, I mean, I don't remember all the values and stuff. No, but I, basically, I what it comes understand. down to is we are going to be a healing. Yeah, we're going to be a healing presence in the city of Toronto. That's what we want to do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The the numbers conversation is interesting. What what fascinates me is is the fact that. Martin Luther King Jr., Gandhi, uh, we can, we can, and Jesus, we can name their names because they did have numbers. And MLK Jr. moved the soul of a nation and has a, you know, as a statue in stone in Washington, D.C. Gandhi, you know, moved the soul of many millions of people and has a name for that, both of whom have, have also have very interesting tidbits about their profiles. Um, Jesus, of course, changed history in, in a way that, you know, through his life, through um, at least uh, uh, through the record that we have of his words and his life, you know, I, I, I don't think there's any question that he, he's the most influential human being in all of human history. Maybe Confucius. 
Yeah. <laughs> well, if you look at numbers, but, <laughs> but we always we always have to um, test these things by sticking our finger into the water that we have at the moment. So, um, yeah. but good, good, good comeback. Um, there's so much. There's so much built into this that I don't know. Maybe I've I've lost my question. But but again, I, again, I, I really. I, I, I'm fascinated by your story. I'm fascinated by your current convictions. And, and I don't, you know, I don't want to, and, and I, there's some inspiration there. And I, I, I'm, I'm inspired in some ways by, by what you've done, even though I, I obviously um, have taken a different path in life. But let me tell you something. Yeah, go ahead. I came out with my book. And one of the biggest surprises was a number of ministers who wrote me to say, I wish I had your courage. Mm. I wish I could say the things that you're saying. I wish I could survive by being honest. We've not created a culture in the church and almost any church. I don't point the finger at the Christian Reformed Church specifically here. But we just haven't created, because of our institutional concerns to keep the big family together and keep the ship of state going, we have not made the church a place like unto what it originally was, where um, there was a lot of discussion about amongst a lot of people who had different ideas. And uh, it's tragic. When I, one of the hardest things about being the banner editor for those 10 years was that I lived by the conviction that I was not hired to um, be a loose cannon. I wanted to bring people one step along in a direction that I thought would be good for them. Because after all, you are an editor and you are hired to pick a direction and go there. But never more than one step at a time. And what I discovered working in that building of people who loved the Christian Reformed Church and who were trying hard to be good Christians is that there was a serious lack of imagination and a serious lack of willingness to try new things other than rearranging the deck chairs with this new program or that new program, but to rethink what we're doing. Um, because everybody had this excellent idea at the back of their heads. And it was, let's keep this thing together. Mm. Like that pressure to make this community that we're a part of, you know, to keep it safe and to keep it together, um, sloughs off all these um, courageous attempts to make a change which is one of the reasons why I'm more and more of the conviction that denominations are poison. Hmm. Because I understand that institutional pressure. I live it. I even appreciate the love that's behind it. Mm -hmm. But I see that it's not a, in the long term, in order to be who you have to be for such a time as this, it's not healthy. Um, so I, on that le level alone, I've become much more interested in congregational approaches to living out faith and community. But I suppose even on that level, congregations have their own inner um, tensions. Um, although I have to be honest, like in the four congregations I've served, I have not felt that tension. Mm. It could be I, I've seen it in other places, but um, it, it, for, for people to get together because they agree on what naturally comes to their lips when they want to talk about the most important things in life, it's a rare and beautiful thing. And every time we step in to try to preserve it and keep it going and keep it going, uh, to normalize it, to, to institutionalize it, um, we rob it, we rob that institution of the very inspiration that created it in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it, it's a hard, it's a hard practical issue to figure out. I think it's well said. I think it's well said. 
I, I'll, I'll just share with you. I know you've done a little bit of poking around at the Jordan Peterson stuff. Um, you know, obviously my, I, my YouTube channel sort of, I had, I had a member of my church uh, named Freddie came to me one day and said, you know, pastor, you and me should do a TV program together. <laughs> I said, uh, I don't think that's going to happen. Um, why don't I, so I, why don't I just make little videos and we'll have a little, we'll have a little show and I'll put it on, I'll put it on YouTube so you can watch yourself and you can, your mom can watch us and so on and so forth. And that became the Freddie and Paul show. And then Jordan Peterson came along and I found, I found that movement fascinating because I, you know, looked around and here I am in this, this tiny little church and, you know, we're not setting the world on fire and, and there in Toronto, you know, you're a, I don't know how to, I don't, you know, you've, you've got plenty of empty seats in your place and Phil Reinder is a friend and, you know, guy I went through college and seminary with, he's, he's not far from the Toronto campus. And, and I thought, how and why on earth is Jordan Peterson bringing together 600 people paying 40 bucks a pop to hear him ramble for two hours plus about the Bible? And so I made a video or two about that and people started watching my channel and people keep watching and I'm not ever quite sure why, but they insist that I go on and I found it fun. But one of the things that started was a meetup because a bunch of people said, oh, we should do a meetup. I said, uh, okay. And I thought nobody would show because that's been my usual experience of, you know, churches try all kinds of crazy things to bring wandering people in who would give them a half hour in exchange for a hot dog or a piece of cotton candy or something. And, um, we just started a meetup and what was so what has been so delightful about the meetup and my experience on the YouTube channel has been, especially the meetup has been just gathering. Oh, there's never fewer than a dozen between 12 and 30 people who will come into a room and, and talk honestly about what they think and care about. And, and, there's our meetups are completely unstructured and so people can and do say almost anything at them the vast majority of the people are not christians and i found that to be a, a really delightful experience in ministry and something similar to what you just articulated is that i'd had tremendous difficulty and gendering in the church. I always wanted small groups in the church to be a place where people could say just about anything as long as they were sincere and it was spoken in good faith. And that started, and that was dramatic and inspiring. Um, and so I've always had, you know, some, some fascinations about what an institution if that's the right word, what, what it would be to, to at least have people be able to be honest. And again, I think that's probably deeply part of what I found inspiring and endearing about your story, is that you had the courage to be honest, and it has cost you, but um, you did it anyway. And it sounds like in some ways you've been blessed by it. Yeah, Jordan Peterson's interesting. You know, why can he fill a stadium and, and no one else can? I mean, Jordan Peterson could, in large measure, because as a tenured professor, he could make a lot of noise safely. He could rant and rail and say the most outrageous things in the university context, and no one could do anything about it. And that, you know, he took advantage of that big time. And uh, he's not saying anything that's radically different that you can't find in, you know, Marcus Aurelius or some other place like that. But, um, you know, ministers uh, are not paid to um, have to exercise that kind of freedom within their institutional settings. We do something at our church that's called Soul Table that's on Sunday nights. It's for people of all faiths or no faith. We start with a meal, we have only secular music, we do TEDx type talks with people from many faiths or no faith about um, issues that matter to Toronto and 
that um, have to do with finding meaning in life. So we'd like to hear multiple perspectives and invite multiple perspectives. It's, we've had some success with it. And uh, so, you know, yeah. As for the cost to me personally, the cost came in the years leading up to my decision to leave. Hmm. Um, because I suffered a great deal of inner anguish about this desire on my part to be on the one hand authentic and true to what my convictions were, but on the other hand being true to this institution that I loved and cared for with all my heart, soul, and mind. And um, those were difficult years, the last couple of years in the um, Christian Reformed Church. Say after, it got worse and worse after the banner until I left. And um, the, the United Church for me has been like a really safe landing place. And I, I shouldn't, you know, I have to be honest, like the congregation where I am, it's not tiny. It's a lot of fun. It's, um, you know, there's a staff of nine people. There's a million dollar budget. It's, um, it's, it's doing great things in the community. These are really interesting people who have um, great ideas. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's been a wonderful experience for me. And these people have just embraced me. You know, none of this were suspicious of you because you came out of the evangelical church or anything like that. Um, they just embraced me. And uh, so I do see the last eight or nine years when I've been in the United Church as kind of like a big sigh of relief for me personally, um, filled with um, a, a great adventure. And then along the way, I've had the freedom, the time, the energy uh, to continue reading widely and thinking deeply, not always correctly. But, um, you know, if you're a man of the cloth, I just don't get these guys and gals now who get out of seminary and think the, the thing they got to do is grow a church and what's the latest method and what's this thing and what's that thing, you know, this church growth plan and, and like, I'm interested in that on the side, especially because I'm very interested in preaching as an oral activity and how we can make that work in a post literate society. So I'm interested in that, but what is the lovely thing about being a minister? It is A, inspiring people to do great things, and B, it's to study. I mean, to be you're paid to think deeply and to share what you're thinking about with these people who care. Yeah. Lovely. What, you know, um, it's great. I love it. So, um, the cost came before I joined the United Church. I love the Christian Reformed Church, and I, I'm sure there's people who've moved from, like I have a friend who started in the Christian Reformed Church, became a Mennonite in youth group, became a Mennonite seminary professor, quit the Mennonite Church, and now he's an Anglican priest, and then he retired. Like, all the people I know who have been on these journeys, they they don't journey because they're mad at the group they're with, um, at least among my friends. They journey because they want a closer match between their convictions and dreams and where they can accomplish them. And uh, so, you know, I read that in the latest banner. I still get the banner for free because it was a longstanding policy that all past banner editors get a free banner. <laughs> I, it's it's actually funny because it's an issue that I had to face a couple of times as an editor because, you know, the the subscription infrastructure is not designed to offer continual free subscriptions to just a few select people, right? But anyways, it somehow works for me now. And um, I saw that Timmermans resigned, yeah. uh, and I. I was trying to, you know, you, you always have to read these articles between the lines. And all I could gather from this was that there was a big story behind, between the lines that wasn't being told. Um, and it probably was not a story about Timmerman's personal 
um, uh, I mean, it didn't have anything to do with morality or cheating or any of those right, other right, things that we've right, heard of. It right. had to do with a change of direction that Timmermans couldn't buy or something like that. I don't know. And I just felt bad for Timmermans because I've been there, you know, like I know what it's like to, to, to believe something and to want something and to work for something with people that you love and then have to say goodbye. Yeah. That's a terrible thing. Um, I still love the Christian Reformed Church. They piss me off all the time. I read, you know, the banner or synodical reports, and I just want to throw it in the garbage. Like I can get, like I have that freedom now, right? I, the, the constraints are gone. But I, I, you know, I'm still feel like I'm a part of the family. I feel like I'm, uh, like my sisters or must have felt when they stopped going to church. And, you know, my parents were not crazy about that, right? Yeah. Like, sure, you're still part of the family, but it's, it's a little bit different now. Yeah. And um, that's how I feel with respect to the Christian Reformed Church. I, I, I feel like I'm, there, there's a blood relationship, a blood thicker than water relationship that I can't get rid of. But, you know, I've really drifted far away. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, I, well, do you have anything you want to ask me? Well, um, why isn't your church growing? I have no I'm idea. I'm always interested in that. I've been here 22 years. I, when have I got you been here, there too long? That's I, probably it, it. If I'd leave, they'd find a better pastor. Um, well, not better, but someone more suited to their relation, their, their place in time, their geographical location, their you. I mean, you got a lot of other interests. Don't don't people kind of hit you over the head with, "Hey, you got to grow our church." What's all this internet stuff? No, no. no well, I'm they're honest. they're excited um, because people do people do visit because of the internet stuff, mm -hmm. and you know, very few stick. Um, one of the people asked me at a meetup once, "What happens when the meetup is larger on Sunday night than it is on Sunday morning coming to here?" I said, "Well, sometimes it is, but." I'm not worried about that. And the church doesn't seem worried about that. The church is very non-anxious about my use of my time. And they don't watch my videos, but they see the effects and they like it. So I go on. Good. Good. So um, why is your church so small? I mean, the, uh, leave, let's leave aside any ministerial questions because obviously I was actually pulling your leg there more than anything else. But, but, but why are you having a, you're a good evangelical church um, in a reformed tradition uh, with this you know, world changing perspective of Kuiper or if you don't like that, the doctrinalist perspective or if you don't like that piety, like you got a couple of bows in your, a couple of arrows in your quiver. Like what's the problem? This, this church, it's, it's, you know, I, I think about this, I think about this often, obviously, um, because, you know, my livelihood in some ways is dependent upon it. It's a, it's a very unique church in that it is probably the most diverse small group of people I have ever seen. The, you've got people here who have are very well educated and people here who are completely illiterate. You've got ethnically, it's extremely diverse. Um, it, there's, there's, there's not one thing that people can sort of, oh, this is, this is the, the way to gather this group of people. I don't know. Um, I, a lot of it is, you know, we're in a bad area of town and, you got to kind of step over homeless people to get in. I think we're too, I think I'm too Jesus-y for people who might be interested in mainline and a lot of the reformed people who come in here looking for a real reformed church these days, well, they're going to go to the, you know, PCA or um, the U, you know, the, um, the reformed church of the U.S., the ruckus church. I, we just don't fit in any of the things that you could gather a group of people. And so I'm a misfit person and this is the land of misfit toys. And I don't know how we've managed to stay open this long, but 
we're still yeah, here. Well, just remember what I, what I said about numbers. <laughs> you know, it's not about how big or small you are. But I mean, uh, you know, in my congregation too, on good Sundays, we have 120, you know, leading up to Christmas, leading up to Easter. Of course, no one now, although we're doing something every day online. That's interesting. We're getting more people online than we do in our worship. Yeah. Like people are lonely and they're signing up for Bible studies and meditation time and pre, uh, two sermons on Sunday and, uh, and in big numbers. Uh, meditation class online has, I think, almost tripled in size this last time from what the number that usually comes. So we're up almost 40. So, uh, yeah, it's not about, but it's not about the numbers. It's not about the numbers. It's about other stuff. We talked about that. Well, you know, it's strange because a thousand people will have seen my rough draft before 40, 40 people witness it in person back when we had people in the room on Sundays instead of me on video instead um, because of COVID. So, and, and, I, and that's part of the reason the church has embraced this because they say, you know, gosh, this church has tried everything. And it's like, yeah, we'll be alive for as long as we're alive. And Paul, you seem to be helping people online. And so that's, I guess, part of us too. And we like the meetup people who come in and the meetup people come in and they're mostly young men. And young men are one guy who's a stone cold atheist says, you mean a bunch of old ladies are paying for to have the lights and heat on while we have our meetup group and they start giving money to the church. So that helps it stay open. So it's, who knows? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My, own, my, my other question would be like, as someone who's no longer in the CRC and doesn't talk to many CRC people and only gets it third hand through the banner. Like, is the CRC going to open the door to gay people or not? Like, no. I just can't imagine how it is going to survive, at least in Canada, without, like, all the people I know in the CRC just shake their heads and say, yeah, I can't believe we're still in the dark ages. But well, of course, the, maybe the CRC, I know of US, USA and Canada might split. I don't know if by nationality is something that will the CRC will be able to maintain, for one thing. Yeah, I, I, I sense that there was a little bit of that behind the Timmermans thing. Yeah. So that's one issue. But I think, you know, I've been watching the RCA quite closely. And because of a bunch of um, a, a few projects that the CRC had been doing that I kept getting before I did the videos things, I kept getting hired to, to, to lead. You know, the RCA is interesting in that you've got these East Coast mainline congregations who are very affirming, but all of the growth is in other places where all of the, all of the energy is running in the other direction. And so I don't, I, there, here's a phrase, churches split right and leak left. And so um, I think as a denomination, there's not a lot of future in flipping on, on the LGBT issue for the CRC. And for that reason, I don't think I'll see any movement in that in my lifetime. Yeah, I, that's kind of what I thought too. I, um, it is interesting the differences between Canada and the United States. I mean, let's be honest, the American church has never been reticent about hiring Canadians for, for important positions, you know, and the banner editor is one of the best examples, but also seminary professors and, and other, the, Peter Borgdorf was a Canadian for that matter. Um, so it's, it's not a welk, it's not a problem with people not liking each other or not willing to trust each other. There is, real cultural differences between the United States and Canada. And um, there's real national cultural differences. Uh, you know, Trump versus Trudeau, just watch a couple of Trudeau, 11 o'clock um, news conferences on the COVID thing and you say, holy cow, this is what America needs. Um, <laughs> you know, it's pastoral, it's warm, it's pointed, it's, 
accurate. It's science. It's he doesn't um, he doesn't and, fight and with it, the reporters. No, <laughs> no. Good morning, Mr. Trudeau. Nice to talk to you. I have a question. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so there's some real cultural differences. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know where they, I, the, the, I never felt as close or at home in the CRC in the States as I did in both of my Canadian congregations. There's a, there's something that clips that has nothing to do with theology, nothing to do with beliefs, but it's just your, your home, you know? Yes. And I, there was a sense in which I was never at home in um, the American Christian Reformed Church that I could never put my finger on why that was. Even with people who agreed deeply with me, you know, on, on a lot of the issues. It, and if it's hard for me <laughs> to get other people at a really deep level who are exactly like me, I just can't imagine how tough it is for people who are truly different ethnicities, different sexualities, and all that kind of stuff. It must be hard to join the CRC. Well, you know, your, your comment about the diversity of the CRC is important and germane to that observation, though, that... Mm -hmm. I mean, the, the Christian Reformed Church I grew up in and the Christian Reformed Church I pastor now, um, it, it's, there's, a, it's, there's a lot that's out there, and there's certainly some strains that hold through in many ways, but there's a, you know, people in church, it's a, it's, it's, it's a very complicated, it's a very complicated sheepfold. And, and I don't think that's ever, I, you know, yeah. again, and you read, you read the new, you read between the lines of the epistles of Paul and you get the sense that, and the other epistles that, holy cow, you know, th that was a, that was a, that was a very complex dynamic situation that, you know, you read first John, um, you read Paul and you just think, yeah, the world has always been really complicated because people are complicated. And so people, people make their stands in funny ways in funny places. Yeah, no, absolutely true. Um, yeah, I, I don't really have anything else to say other than uh, I'm having the time of my life now. And um, there's another book coming. Oh, really? Uh, I'm yeah, I, I'm almost, I finished the first draft of a novel. Uh, I have a cousin, first cousin, three generations removed, who was executed by firing squad by the English during the Boer War. Wow. For um, breaking some, some convention or other having to do with firing his gun at the wrong time. And I have his diary. And so that served as the spark for... Um, writing uh, a novel. I hope to get that done at the end of my sabbatical next uh, March. And then uh, I'm going to write a second uh, book as a follow-up to uh, I'm Not Sure. But I'm going to do it as kind of tongue-in-cheek systematic theology. Oh, boy. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm going to start with, pro I'm going to start with prolegomena and end with last things. Huh. And I'm going to just, I'm going to try to talk in a very uh on the on a very street level about um other options in christianity than the evangelical or fundamentalist traditions offer okay i that, that Tongue, book that book about happen. that book about your your family member in the boer war that isn't gun rights is it i mean you got in trouble for <laughs> Yeah, in Canada, we believe in um, the fact that we, in Canada, we don't believe in gun rights, except that only criminals and cops should have them. Oh, okay. Well, John, I want to say thank you, because you gave me a couple hours of your, of your time and of your life, and I, 
you know, what I wanted to do, and this is, is what I feel I've gotten, because I just wanted to hear you talk, and I wanted, to, I wanted to have a higher resolution view of your story and your thinking, because again, your, um, I mean, your story is, it fascinates me. I hope one of your book projects at some point will, will be a memoir, because I think, um, and, and, and your first book is to a degree, but, um, it, but you're a good writer, and you're a good thinker, and, um, and there's a reason people come and listen to you. Okay, well, thanks. It was nice talking to you, Paul. Thanks, John. You take care. We'll catch you later. All right, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.